Hey, gentlefolk. My name is Malte Krug. Welcome back to another episode of All About Keys. When the Yamaha DX7 got released in 1983, it revolutionized the sonic landscape. And due to the complete digital nature of its sound generating engine, it could be produced much cheaper than the analog synthesizers of the day. Yamaha sold it in droves and its sound dominated the 1980s pop music, for better or worse. For a long time I hated the famous DX7 e-piano, because you couldn't flee it in those days. It was used in every other song and just annoyed the heck out of me then. <laughs> But since 25 years or so, it grew back on me. It's a rich sound that is very variable when played dynamically, especially from a weighted piano-like keyboard like Yamaha's own KX88, which, by the way, is still my favorite when it comes to weighted electronic keybeds. But not only the digital nature of the innards helped Yamaha to cut costs, the user interface got reduced to a display and one edit fader. Gone were the masses of pots and faders for each parameter of the analog subtractive synthesizers. That, together with all the unfamiliar terms and functionality of the new FM synthesis, spotted by the DX7, got it a reputation of being unprogrammable by the user without a degree in physics. So most players stuck to using the factory patches. Yamaha itself recognized this in 1984 and tried to help those problems in publishing editor software for the DX7 and DX9 synthesizers for their own brand new home computer, the CX5M. If you're interested in more info about said computer, you might want to watch this video right here. Let's check out how Yamaha tried to help the desperate DX7 owner. You might have seen a similar setup in my CX5M video when I showed you the computer's functions and some of the available software. But in this video it's about using the CX5M as a helpful editing device for the supposedly unprogrammable DX7 FM synthesizer. My DX7 is connected to the computer via MIDI in both directions and already switched on. And this is how these two editor programs were delivered, one for the DX7 and the other for its smaller brother, the DX9. I made a video about the differences and similarities of those, you can watch it following this link. Both came with a manual and on cartridges like this. You just plug it into one of the CX5M slots and only then you power up the computer. Never insert or remove these cartridges when the computer is switched on. The other one by the way is a RAM cartridge for data storage. The software starts automatically and immediately talks to the DX7 removing its memory protection and sending a bulk request for a MediaSysX dump of the internal sounds. In this list you can see the sound names appear as soon as the SysX data arrives. This first page is the librarian of the editor. You can copy sounds into different memory slots or save and load whole banks to and from cassette or cartridge. Some software for the CX5M can be used with a mouse, but this one is only working with key commands. On the bottom there is a list of those. For diving deeper and getting to the edit page you hit F1. This whole page represents the FM sound in detail showing the parameters of the six operators and up here you can see the sound's name and which algorithm is used for it. Using the cursor keys you can move around to different parameters of the page. With a graph key you switch between a numerical or graphical display of the operator's amp envelopes. These curves can be zoomed if needed. When the cursor is on one of the LFO parameters up here, the select key will get you to the pitch envelope. And the graph key will do its thing here as well. You aren't able to see every sound parameter combined on one page, but I think Yamaha did the best with the tiny display resolution of the CX5M. Hitting the tap key will get you to the function parameters. The original DX7 can only store one set of these for all the sounds together. Yamaha changed that with the TX7 and the TX816 modules in which each individual sound could hold its own function parameters. Analyzing existing sounds, and I recommend this method, is a good way to begin understanding the innards of FM synthesis. You have to check the structure and how the parts of the sounds are put together. Switching off and on individual operators is a good way to start this. Here it's done by the number keys 1 to 6.
Like I mentioned in the other DX7 video, the operators on the lowest row are called carriers. These are the operators you will actually hear. So if you switch all of these off, you won't hear anything. Now I switch off 3, 4 and 5. We only hear the stack of the operators 1 and 2. If I change the attack on the envelope of carrier operator 1 to be slower, we get this. But if I do the exact same thing with a modulator operator 2, we get a sound change, which sounds a bit like altering a filter. Unlike in subtractive synthesis, you are adding overtones to the fundamental notes. To sum this up, if you change the volumes of carriers manually or by envelopes, you will change volumes. If you change the volume of modulators in a similar way, you will change sound. Ok, let's go a bit further into basic FM. I am by no means an expert in FM synthesis, but having a basic understanding what the different parameters are in name and function compared to parameters of subtractive synthesis helps you to alter sounds in the direction you want them to. For that we will just use an initialized sound, and because not everybody has a CX5M, I will show that directly on the DX7. One thing that is really annoying with the DX7 is that when you switch it on you can alter a function parameter with the edit slider, and for whatever reason by default it is master tune adjust. So whenever you're playing happily away and want to use the volume, but you fiddle around with the wrong slider, suddenly you're getting your synthesizer out of tune, which is kind of annoying. That's why after power up I'm just switching to a different function like battery voltage. And now we're back to play mode. Now this doesn't have any function. You could put a function there like you could switch between poly and mono mode. That might come handy for a boombastic synthesizer solo. Like I already said in my DX7 DX9 combo video, each of the DX7 sounds are built with one of 32 combinations of 6 operators called algorithms. These operators are more than the usual oscillators, they can only produce sine waves, which in subtractive synthesis would sound really boring. Nothing to filter there. In addition, each operator also contains its own amp envelope. But the interaction in between operators is the spice of this synthesis. This is just an initialized sound, so you can only hear operator 1. Algorithm 1 is used, which is that one. Two stacks of operators, but all operators other than number 1 are turned to 0, so we only hear a single sine wave. The DX7 is not reacting directly to what I'm editing. I have to hit the key again and again to hear alterations. If I go to operator 2, which is on top of operator 1, and I turn up its volume, we can hear its influence on the carry operator. When we switch off operator 1, we don't hear anything, of course. If we instead switch off operator 2 completely, we get the sine wave alone from carrier 1 again. Another thing that is important in FM is the relationship between the main frequencies of the individual operators. The coarse frequency in ratio mode is not a fixed frequency. Ratio basically just means that this is the factor that the basic frequency of the operator is multiplied by, depending on which key I'm playing. Half the frequency, ratio factor 0.5, which would be the same as the octave down. Double frequency is the octave higher and here is 3 times the frequency, which is the fifth over the octave and so on and so on, going through the natural harmonic scale. So far we only dealt with the carrier frequency alone. Now I turn up operator 2, which has the same frequency as operator 1.
the relationship between the frequencies results in different spectrums. When the modulator has the same frequency as the carrier, you get all harmonics following upwards. The louder the modulator, the farther you get up the spectrum. If I switch the modulator's coarse frequency to a ratio of 2, it's now oscillating twice the speed of the carrier. There are gaps in the harmonic scale upwards. Only every other harmonic can be heard. So this is just the bass harmonics and the 3rd, the 5th, the 7th and 9th. Almost looks and sounds like a square wave, doesn't it? Following this rule, when I switch the ratio to 3, it's 1, 4, 7, 11, 14. Now a difference of 4, resulting in harmonics 1, 5, 9, 13, 17, 21. Ok, enough theory. You just go by your ears. Use whatever harmonic spectrum you get out of all of this. It can be surprising and fun. And that is what we're here for, aren't we? When you want to get away from harmonically sounding waveform spectrums that only contain frequencies from the harmonic series, then you have to use the fine tune of the modulator's frequency. Results will get more noise-like and metallic. Here you get a small glimpse of why the DX7 is really good in bell sounds and vibraphones and e-pianos. You have to alter the envelope of course, but there you go. We can even go further into experimental realms when we switch the frequency of an operator to fixed mode. Let's start with the frequency of the carry operator. Now it's the same frequency no matter where I play the keyboard. But operator 2, the modulator, is still working in ratio, so depending on which key I'm hitting, its frequency changes accordingly. So I get a different FM spectrum on each key. Or let's do it the other way around. Operator 1, the carrier, is back in ratio mode. But operator 2 will be in fixed frequency mode. When going very slow, like 10 Hz, the influence results in a regular vibrato. Like every common LFO would do this. But getting the modulator's frequency into the audible range, we suddenly get even stranger spectrums, depending on where we play and the volume of the modulator. That might sound weird, but can be useful for some experimental digital effect sounds. Let's lower the attack of the modulator's envelope. The same for operator 1, a bit slower attack. Let's change rate 4, so we got not such a harsh release. <laughs> that is really weird. And this is still only using two operators out of the six we have. There is a lot of mathematics and much more complex theory behind all this FM stuff, but I won't go into that here. Most of it I don't understand myself. But there isn't necessarily a need to know all this theory just to have some fun. So when it comes to stacked operators that modulate themselves and then modulate a carrier, like in the more complex algorithms, 16, 17 and 18 for example, there are definitely more expertly experts around that made videos or wrote books about this. Here I just wanted to show you some basic knowledge, so you know, for example, what switching operators on and off results in, 
or for you to know which of the various envelopes of the operators you have to fiddle around with to get sounds longer or slower in attack or having an effect like an opening filter or something like that. So I hope this has been helpful. Yamaha tried to give you all the information you might need to actually program some FM sounds right on the panel. Like printing the algorithms on the front or the envelopes, because they are really different but more versatile than regular ADSR envelopes. You just have to learn the new names for parameters you already know. Now after this broadside of info, I'll give you some examples of more modern editor librarian software for the synthesizer, if you prefer not to work directly with the DX7 without the help of a computer. At first my favorite editor software, the long discontinued Magic Sound Diver. It's not only a DX7 editor, but covers edit modules for hundreds of MIDI units, not only synthesizers. And you can make your own adaptions, if one is missing for a piece of your gear. I got it to still work with Windows 10. Nowadays you need to be lucky to find a copy on the used market. The CD-ROM it comes with functions as its copy protection. I always liked the uncomplicated handling of sound libraries in it, even when having sounds of different units collected in one. As you can see, in the one-page DX7 editor it uses graphics for all envelopes, including the level scaling. I think I will make a special video about this software at some point. I really like it. Leave a comment if you would like to see that. And now for software that's still available. The X Manager by FM Alive is only $20 and works on modern systems. It does not only cover editing the original DX7, but also the TX modules, the DX7 Mark II, and even all four operator models. Everything that needs to be is represented graphically. Then there's MidiQuest by SoundQuest, another commercial multi instrument editor and librarian like SoundDiver has been. I like the contrasted color palette, which makes it easier to see a lot of parameters when they are crammed together like this. Level scaling in this case is not shown as envelopes, but it's clear enough the way it's handled here. It even can import various library formats of other synth editors like the aforementioned SoundDiver. Or just regular SysX files. And then of course there's Dext, which compared to all other editors in addition is a fully fledged DX7 synth plugin in itself. You don't need a real DX7 for enjoying those famous FM sounds. It sports a graphic display for most envelopes, but not for the level scaling but it's for free, so no complaints from me here. I left out all the vintage editors that were available for the Atari ST computers in the day, but we'll get back to them in their own video. If I missed the software, please leave a comment down below. Let's go back to the DX7 voicing program for the Yamaha CX-5M for a second. I think it has been very useful for many musicians in the day, and I bet for some it's been the main argument to actually buying a CX-5M at all. Personally, I started into the MIDI computer age with an Atari ST and the notator sequencer about five years after this came out, but I was always curious about how this old machine would stand its ground in comparison. And now you know as well. In addition to that, I hope I could provide you with some overview of the basics of FM synthesis, and maybe this gives you the confidence to dive in and alter sounds that just need a bit of tweaking to fit your music. As you could see, I'm also not exactly an expert for the higher levels of complex FM programming, but I never shy away from fiddling around. I know, it's very different to the so-called analog synthesis you are used to, but just dare to alter some sounds, start with a simple thing like changing the algorithm. My first own FM sound was a weird digital explosion noise, which I started by doing exactly that. And this is not restricted to the vintage Yamaha hardware. You could use these tips with every FM synth around from new Korg and Yamaha synthesizers to all those software emulations from Arturia, NI or the mentioned text. There are a lot of books and videos to find online which go much more into detail with FM than I did here. Check those out, it might be a fun ride to discover. Thanks for sharing your valuable time with me. Please consider to like the video, subscribe to the channel and to ring the bell. More interesting videos for you are in the making. See you again soon on all about keys.